the Global Order. I'm Mehind Olsen Gupta. I'm absolutely delighted to have Kom Carpenter join me in this conversation. Kom is a very veteran Europe watcher. He's French by nationality. He has a long engagement with India. And what he has really worked for in the last 30, 40 years is to build a bridge of understanding between Asia and Europe. This is a particularly interesting time to speak to Kom. Not only is there a war, of course, in Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine, France very recently this week was up in flames, uh, riots which spread to Belgium, to other Switzerland, to other parts of Europe. Uh, Kom has very distinct views on where Europe stands today, where France stands today, where Germany stands today, and what is the future of the European Union. Thanks, Kom, for joining me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Good I, want to begin, I want to begin by asking you, Kom, uh, talk us through your opinion about what has just happened in France. You know, we have heard conversations about decivilization, the great replacement, all kinds of things. But there seems to be there seems to be something fundamentally uh, a little, you know, amiss in the deliberations. Something we are missing. What is it? First, I would like to remind uh, you and the audience that uh, this is a problem that has been building up for at least 40 years. So this is not a new thing. There are periodic uprisings, if you want to call them that way, uh, which are uh, heavily uh, laced with vandalism and destruction of property and uh, robbery. So there are a number of antisocial and criminal elements that are involved. But on a deeper level, uh, this is the result, as is now publicly acknowledged reluctantly uh, by almost all, that this is a result of uh, uncontrolled mass immigration from certain countries, primarily in North Africa, uh, which have had a rather difficult history of relations with France, um, compounded by uh, memories of colonization and uh, the violence that uh, was part of it. And therefore, uh, if you add to that, the fact that uh, we are now living with the second or third generation of those immigrants and refugees, many illegal, we find that uh, they are uh, not assimilated. They are not integrated. They are under the influence of uh, certain insurrectional propagators, you might say, or uh, whether they are religious leaders or just uh, social influencers. And as a result, a lot of that youth, which is very poorly educated, is turning to petty crime, is not able to find a place in society. So very quickly, uh, other activities take over, uh, including drug trafficking, racketeering, and f gangs form, as in many other countries, uh, in especially the United States. And those gangs uh, develop a culture of violence and sort of fake heroism, which consists in attacking and challenging the representatives of authority, whether it is the police, uh, the bureaucracy, the politicians, especially those who are not uh, supporting them, and also uh, the church, uh, because uh, there is a very distinct Islamic element in the kind of uh, you know rebellion that we are witnessing. Uh, now these are riots; they are not an organized insurrection, but uh, those riots are obviously concatenated with each other because of the social media, which means that the moment somebody raises trouble somewhere, then a lot of other cells uh, are triggered and start uh, rising, raising the same kind of trouble in their own neighborhoods. And before you know it, you get a chain reaction and big parts of the country literally go up in flames. Some people say that some of the problem goes all the way back to various European countries and their colonizing history. Uh, tell us what is your perspective about that argument? Undoubtedly, the decolonization, which in the case of Algeria was quite bloody, uh, 
contrary to Morocco, which was never a full colony, but more of a protectorate, uh, a bit like the princely states in India under the British, or Tunisia. Uh, Algeria was wracked by a very violent uh, war. And following the independence of Algeria, the revolutionary forces took over and created a one-party regime, which uh, is controlled by the army, a bit like Pakistan, but uh, left-leaning in a way, if you can call it left, although it may not have much of a meaning. And we know that uh, following uh, the separation between France and Algeria, because let's not forget Algeria was technically part of France. It wasn't a colony. It was French territory, just like Brittany or Alsatia, at least in uh, on paper. And a, of course, all the French who lived in Algeria, 99% of them came back to France. And a lot of Arabs followed, either because they had taken the side of the French during the War of Independence and were therefore threatened with death. In fact, many of them were killed by their compatriots. And also, a bit later on, France, after World War II, needed a lot of uh, workers uh, because of the, you know, the, the devastation of the war had been followed by a major uh, economic boom. Uh, with uh, a great deal of uh, industrialization. So you needed industrial workers and uh, easier and cheaper manpower was located in North Africa. So that led to the creation of large colonies of people who uh, came to work and did not create any trouble. But once they established themselves with their families and had children and began to develop a separate society, then the problem began. And I must you know, remind the listeners that uh, the first party to call attention on that growing problem was uh, at that time the National Front, which was accused, of course, of being far right and fascist and uh, things that we all know about in India, too, because of certain parallels. And yet they were the first ones who were very clear sighted about the fact that France was essentially breeding a uh, major internal threat, uh, a time bomb. Of course, at that time, it was mostly ignored, particularly by the left, but even by the center and the right. They said, well, you know, you are just alarmist and you are uh, creating divisions in society. But in fact, uh, there was a perception back in the 1980s uh, that this would become a major, major problem. And it only uh, got worse since then. Uh, at first, it was very gradual and slow. But in the last 20 years, it's been literally uh, lightning speed, you know, warp speed, as Trump would put it. Let's go, um, in your opinion, explain to us why this assimilation doesn't happen. Because some people say this assim assimilation doesn't happen because, uh, you know, communities close door, uh, doors on the outside world, so to speak, and they're influenced, as you're saying, by religious, uh, you know, leaders, by influencers of all kinds and so on and so forth. Others argue that, well, actually, they don't, they face discrimination in the wider society. And because they face this discrimination in this, this closing of doors is a response to that. Which side of this argument do you stand and why? I think there is truth on both sides. Uh, it is very difficult to merge two societies which are so different in their stages of evolution and in their mindsets and even in their social organization. On the one hand, you have a largely secular, rather individualistic, I would almost say pleasure-seeking or at least uh, individual reward-seeking French society, which also has a certain skeptical or cynical background in its culture and history. And on the other, you have uh, rather rigidly patriarchal societies, which are rooted in tribal mores, and uh, which have a very limited cultural horizon, most of which is dictated by one religion and one book, and also by tribal customs. You might find analogies in Afghanistan and uh, in many other parts of the world. So as a result, this new, relatively new community or this set of communities that try to find their place in society have a tendency to close upon themselves because 
unlike in the 1960s, 70s, now, at least for the last 40 years, they are continuously exposed to media from uh, their countries of origin and from the Middle East, which means that they are constantly being reminded of who they are, what the past was, how the French were guilty of colonizing and uh, you know, exploiting them, and how uh, Islam is a potent force which fights enemies in many parts of the world, in Palestine, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, all those countries where there is a perception uh, among Muslims that they are uh, invaded and uh, attacked and killed by Western powers under the aegis of the United States primarily. So as a result, the resentment and the alienation build up and any pretext among young uneducated people who have a lot of energy, who have a gang culture and who have very little hope of making good in life, uh, it leads to uh, these explosions of violence. Uh, it, one doesn't need to think of a big conspiracy, but even if there is no conspiracy, there is what you might call a, you know, an organic tendency to try to undermine and destroy the whole society in order to replace it with something which will be more suitable to them. And of course, those who try to intellectualize this, and there are religious leaders who make no bones about it, no mystery about it, that eventually Europe will fall like a ripe fruit to Islam. And uh, as a result, these societies will become increasingly Islamic and the Sharia will be implemented. But even if that doesn't happen, and as long as it doesn't happen, uh, these immigrant communities have a right to be ruled by their own laws. And therefore they reject or ignore much of the legal, administrative, and other apparatus provided by uh, the French state or in other countries of Europe by uh, the German or the British state. Now, this is, of course, in a way supported or favored by the left, most of the left, which says that, you know, everybody has a right to their own uh, lifestyle and culture, and uh, these people have been exploited and oppressed. Therefore, now it is right for them to enjoy uh, make their own choices, and the whole society should just accommodate them, and even if need be, sacrifice the basic principles of the so-called liberal order and uh, uh, democratic society, because communities have their own rights too, and therefore if a community has it, a different rule than, say, the democratic system, then that should be respected as well. That is very much the talk of the so-called uh, intellectual left. Uh, which is not at all uh, what the original old Marxist left was about, because the Marxist left wanted everybody to be pretty much homogenized and to be a disciplined force to overthrow capitalism and create a new society. Uh, instead of that, the so-called liberal left, which dominates, is more about individual freedom things, you know, whether, whether you can uh, cross-dress or whether you can, uh, I mean, it's basically about personal satisfaction and therefore they have no real objection to uh, what they see as a uh, legitimate uh, reaction to the oppressive state. And the victims are most of the citizens on both sides and particularly uh, those people who are in charge of protecting law and order, which means the police, who are regularly getting insulted, attacked, threatened, in their families also, and whenever there is a conflict, a lot of policemen get wounded uh, and sometimes killed. So you are not talking about a one-sided uh, exercise of violence. The violence is very real on both sides. And let's face it, if the police did not intervene, which is often the call for the, from the left, you know, let them do what they want, what you end up do, getting is a, a complete uh, social chaos and destruction of a lot of public and private property. Well, let's go, this, of course, is not confined only to France. I mean, we are seeing the spread and we have seen the spread earlier to Belgium, to Switzerland, to other parts, you know, Sweden constantly, uh, you know, news now comes that cities like Malmo have a problem, uh, you know, in parts of Germany and so on and so forth. Uh, 
what's really going on in Europe, in your opinion, uh, Com? And uh, how does this impact the great European Union project? Many people feel that the European Union project is failing, if it has not already failed, because one, these allogenous communities are creating a real threat to any kind of national or supranational structure that runs on the basis of uh, European liberal secularism. And to give you an example, there is probably about 1 million people in France who drive without a license. And almost all of them are immigrants or coming from originally immigrant communities. And if they are stopped by the police, in most cases, they refuse to show their papers and they drive on. And this was probably the reason or at least the pretext for the shooting of that 17 uh, year old uh, boy who was driving a yellow Mercedes, uh, which is rather unusual for somebody who's 17 years old from an immigrant community and who refused to obey police summons. Uh, and this has become so endemic that I think there are several cases every day of people driving off without uh, accepting to be uh, stopped by the police. So as a result, what you get is a growing climate of uh, lawlessness. And it also creates a you know, two-dimensional society, or at least a two-tier society, because on the one hand, the original community, you might say, the indigenous community, has to abide the laws and can uh, be harshly penalized if it doesn't. But then uh, the police do not dare or do not want, in many cases, to get in trouble with the immigrant, uh, particularly the very young, because they feel that the state is not on their side. The state will, the justice system will almost always side with the immigrants saying, well, you know, you couldn't, you shouldn't do that. That was abusive force. And the fact that many of those uh, young people who create trouble are below 18 means that uh, there are serious problems if they get hurt or if they even are brutalized because the police and the state apparatus are held responsible and the policemen could lose their jobs, go to jail. So they are very, very careful. You know, what you saw, the same thing you saw in America in the BLM, during the BLM protest, where many policemen in certain areas of the US refused to arrest or, uh, you know, stop uh, delinquents because they feel that uh, if the delinquents happen to belong to another community, then it's too dangerous to do that. Now, at the scale of Europe, what we are witnessing is uh, this kind of lawlessness at the, you might say, at the low level, at the low economic and social level. But then you are also witnessing enormous dissatisfaction in the population mainstream, which is turning to fury in many cases. In France, we have had three years of periodic uh, marches, protests, uprising against the government, in which even the president's personal safety was threatened on one occasion, and where uh, you sometimes could wonder if the state would survive. Uh, it happened before the COVID crisis. It happened, uh, there were lots of problems during the COVID crisis period. And since then, we have witnessed a season of major protests, uh, most of them by, not by immigrants, although some immigrants joined, but by the uh, local, I mean, the indigenous uh, mainstream community, which essentially means that the country is very fragile because it's very divided. There is no unity. And uh, you see the rise, not only in France, but all over Europe, of what is traditionally now called the far right, which would have been called 40 years ago the conservative, patriotic, or nationalist forces, who which feel that you now need to react strongly and harshly. You need to put down the climate of uh, insurrection and disorder, and you need to restore uh, the legitimacy of the state, which is largely gone. But, you know, as we go along in, in, in time, we see that uh, these reactions, one, they are often harshly repressed by the state itself, which seems to be more afraid of the indigenous far right than of the immigrant vandalism and of the far left vandalism. So, uh, for example, in the last uh, riots in France, there were some uh, sailors, you know, the Marines, the equivalent of the Marines, they were not in uniform because they were on uh, on leave, but they saw a group, a gang of young people uh, 
beginning to attack a supermarket in a provincial town in France, in a port city, and they decided to stop them. And so they went after them. Now, these Marines were disciplined by their commander, who said, you had no business intervening in uh, the social uh, situation. In other words, you have no business to try to repress a riot because you are not the police, you are the army, and you cannot take on sides in a, you know, what is essentially an internal uh, dom domestic matter. Now, that shows a great deal of disarray because how long can you pretend that nothing is happening and that basically the army should not be used when in fact it is used, it is deployed all over the country for many years now, since the days of the great terrorist attacks 10, 12 years ago. But the army is there just to show that it's there and it's not clear what it's about. Of course, if they see a terrorist running around with a weapon, they can shoot him down. But uh, otherwise, if there are riots without firearms, then they are supposed to stay away, you know, which means that there is a real problem with security in Europe. And I think it's going to get worse and worse because we see that the administrative level, more and more cities, for example, now in Europe are run by mayors coming from the immigrant community. And very clearly, these mayors do not have the attitude in most cases that you would expect them to have in order to uh, discipline their own, uh, you know, people of their own community who voted for them. So what you are getting now, probably in many, uh, many countries of Europe, are a number of states within the state. And if these states within the states have the support of a religious uh, doctrine of a religious ideology, then you could expect things to uh, get become very dire, uh, as we have seen when there were terrorist attacks, which were obviously prepared and nurtured within certain enclaves uh, inhabited by a particular religious community. As we come to the end of this conversation, Com, talk to us a little bit about what lies ahead for Europe. On one hand, there are people who very optimistically believe that the UK will rejoin the European Union in some form or the other. On another hand, the picture that you're painting is about internal fissures and perhaps the inability uh, by many administrations or of many administrations within Europe to really contain and diffuse these fissures, these tensions. Uh, what lies ahead? Do you believe for instance, as has been spoken of in France, France that uh, this is a moment of decivilization. Uh, do you believe that there is ever going to be a great replacement? Uh, all these fears have been expressed quite openly uh, in France and perhaps in other parts of Europe. What do you think about them? There is no question that Europe is going through a major crisis and that the European Union is continuously being challenged on many fronts because there is a growing feeling that uh, the leadership uh, is uh, governed or inspired by an essentially utopian and realistic ideology, which is the ideology of uh, universal, peaceful globalism run by uh, major NGOs and corporations with governments acting as docile pupils of the Euro in unelected European Commission. And yet the ideological fissures are appearing everywhere. A number of European Union countries are no longer tolerating the directives and the instructions that they are given from Brussels or from Berlin, which is uh, about the same thing. And uh, therefore the perception that the European Union is on the way to becoming a sort of a new German Reich is uh, very acute, especially in Central Europe, but also in countries like Italy and even in France, which is no longer the sort of faithful doppelganger of Germany in the European Union. We have seen that the influence of Brexit has spread and that countries that used to be very uh, unapologetically uh, pro-European or at least pro-EU are now rethinking. And if you ask me, I think the, the straw that broke the camel's back, if I could use that expression, because it's not a straw, was the Ukraine war. Because the Ukraine war, number one, has shown that Europe is essentially bleeding itself, mostly for the sake of the United States, 
and has no real gain to make in Ukraine. Whereas it could easily, if it had been on its own, it could have avoided this by essentially inviting and in a way compelling Ukraine to make a reasonable deal with Russia, which was available until the spring of last year. And yet this was not done because we have a completely NATO controlled leadership in the European Union, exemplified by Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, who now hopes to become the next Secretary General of NATO uh, as a reward for her royal services to the United States in Europe. And now we see that, uh, you know, all the predictions made by European leaders have essentially discredited them because it showed that they are living in a bubble. I mean, you had the French finance minister claiming uh, in uh, March of last year that uh, within a month, Russia will be on her knees and will surrender because we have destroyed her economy with our sanctions. And what happens more than a year later, Russia is actually about as strong or even, well, I might say it hasn't really lost much in terms of economy. And in some ways it has reinforced its own economy, whereas it's Europe, which is now in at risk of sinking. So the complete lack of understanding of the global situation and the enormous arrogance and self-confidence of the European leaders has really sobered people with a sense that they are just no, not ruled by capable and responsible leaders, but by a bunch of opportunists who really don't know what they are doing. And I think that is a very grave verdict for Europe because it will not survive in its present form. Some drastic reforms will have to be made. And even if, as you say, you, the United Kingdom were to join in any form, it would have to be a completely different Europe, which would be, by the way, more what, like in some ways what the United Kingdom wanted in the first place, you know, a sort of free alliance of sovereign states, which are ruled by certain uh, common market uh, agreements, a bit like ASEAN. And I think the big mistake of the European Union was to go too far and to want to create a unified state, which is simply not suitable for Europe in its present form. Well, let's go. Um, you know, some people, uh, I have two last questions for you. My first one is some people point towards an economic crisis also, you know, uh, in Europe, uh, a crisis of inflation, a crisis of jobs, a crisis, so in some cases, even of food uh, and food prices. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? There is no doubt that the crisis has begun. And, uh, you know, some of the most uh, best informed uh, analysts and uh, very experienced uh, advisors to governments like Jacques Attali in France and several others have predicted that, that by August next month, there would be a massive global crisis, uh, primarily caused by the situation in the United States. But then Europe has its own factors of crisis. And uh, no, there's no question that a crisis, whether it begins in Europe or in the US, but I think it will have to begin in, in the US since they still essentially control the Western economy, at least, uh, it is no. There is no question that Europe will be very badly affected by it. I mean, when you see what's happening in Germany, where many very crisis, old... you mean? I, I'm guessing by crisis you mean a, a a recession of some sort. I think it will be a depression. That's what is becoming more and more apparent. It will be a depression combined with a very major social political crisis, which means some governments will be toppled, and they may not. Uh, be replaced by democratic ones. I mean, after all, in Europe, we have just voted, or at least we are voting now. I mean, we, Parliament, is voting a law that would uh, give the state the power to requisition all uh, individuals and private property in case of emergency need, which essentially means that the countries are preparing themselves for the possibility of civil strife and, therefore, the assumption of dictatorial powers. Now, that is an indication that there is no trust in the over, you know, arcing, arching structure of the European Union, which would simply become totally uh, inefficient in case of major trouble erupting in any one EU country. There is no way the European Union could intervene except for lecturing and uh, inciting people to, to settle down. But that is nobody will listen if it gets to that point. So I think the crisis will be uh, multidimensional and it will be ideological, religious, political. And of course, it is the economic collapse in a way that will bring it all to the fore. It's not a very happy picture, but let's face it. I mean, uh, society, I mean, humanity 
has gone through such crises every now and then. And I think we are overdue for one because we have seen what happened in 2007, 2008. And this was just like the preliminary, you know. So now we are, uh, we should expect the, the other shoe to drop. My last question is, um, you know, you, you paint quite a dire uh, picture of the future of the European Union. And one cannot but ask you at the end of this conversation, you know, so we were told in globalization so much about how many of the differences of culture and identity would be submerged uh, either in a sort of, you know, globalized secular format or through just through capitalism and consumption. Uh, but here we are in the summer of 2023 and uh, there seems to be a more pronounced, um, you know, uh, affirmation of culture and identity than ever before. Isn't that curious? It is not if you look at some of the more lucid uh, analysts and writers of the last 40 years, many of them predicted that there would be an inevitable reaction to the excesses of uh, globalist capitalism and the attempt to homogenize society uh, through technology and through uh, certain uh, so-called universal values and laws. Uh, these laws and values have become divisive, and even technology has become very divisive. We see that uh, China and uh, the US are precisely fighting over many things, but over technology more than anything. Who controls the technology? Who shapes it and how to use it? And whose ideology is motivating that technology? For example, you see uh, nowadays, if you go to Google or some of those great search engines, which are primarily Anglo-Saxon, American, you would see that they are by and large shaped by the ruling ideology, the so-called woke liberal ideology. Now, a few countries, including uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, of course, China has been there for a long time. They are all setting up their search engines, which are in fact shaped by their own national ideologies. So what you have is a fracturing of the supposed or attempted uh, unity of mankind around many different sets of values. The rejection, for example, massively in Africa of European, uh, I wouldn't say culture, but of European dictates about uh, lifestyles and how what are the values that you should have and how you should behave. There have been very outspoken statements by African statesmen in the last few uh, uh, months, in fact, that this was no longer acceptable, that they would no longer listen to Europe and that they had alternatives, uh, China, Russia, the Arab states, Iran. So you see, uh, this shows that the world is diversifying, the world is splintering, and uh, the dream or the Fukuyama's dream of the end of history is certainly uh, not come to pass. And in fact, Fukuyama himself has backed down and said that he was wrong about that. You know, so. That uh, rather interesting note, uh, Kom Carpenter, thanks very much uh, for joining me in this wonderful conversation. And thanks for, you know, throwing light on many of the issues, some of the gravest issues, really, uh, that afflict uh, parts of the Western world. In fact, the whole world, but especially parts of the Western world and Europe. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure.